Hey, welcome everyone into the NGK Tech Garage. Thank you for being here today. Looks like the chat's already rolling this morning. Really cool, we have people from all over the world on here and somebody had mentioned in there that uh, there's no borders when it comes to training. That's awesome to hear. You know, we have training from people here from Uruguay, uh, Chile, uh, Romania, all over the world. So it's, it's really awesome. Thank you guys for joining us today. I know with the time change thing, sometimes it's difficult to catch a live class, but really appreciate uh, everybody being here. So today we're talking Euro and Asian wideband or air fuel ratio sensors. And to be 100% honest, guys, a lot of what we're going to talk about today or what we could talk about today was covered in the last wideband class. Wideband or air fuel ratio sensors are very similar when it comes to domestic Asian or Euro in terms of the sensor's actual operation. Now you're going to have differing voltage values or specifications or testing parameters or the way that the, the PCM uh, uses all that information, but the operation of the sensor will be very similar when it comes to five wire widebands or four wire widebands. They're very different sensors and we're going to get into looking at a four wire sensor on a, uh, this is a 2006 uh, Lexus IS250 with the 2.5 liter uh, V6 in there. And then also we're going to look at a five wire on that uh, BMW sitting back there. That's a 530 with the three liter straight six in there. So before we actually get into looking at these, I wanted to show you guys something that we've been working on here for quite a while. It's our training portal that we've created. So if you head out to, and you don't have to do it right now, but if you head out to ngktechportal.com, you're going to find our training portal. Now currently what's on here is not high level a tech master tech type of training what's currently on here is going to be your entry level uh, technician maybe bringing uh, a guy up to speed on some of the new uh, on some of the systems on vehicles it's it's not super high end training at this point it's very basic um, entry level type of stuff but if you go ahead and you create an account on here you'll see you're going to have to enter in some information you'll create an account and then um, we're not going to sell your email address or anything like that. Your email address actually just ends up in a, uh, in a list that we use to send off training announcements to. So like this morning at uh, about an hour before the class or a half hour before the class, an email went out uh, just letting everybody know what was going on, that we're having a class. So if you put your name on this list, if you create yourself an account, you will be added to our emailing list. So once you get inside of here, You'll see we have training categories and an about tab. This is going to be constantly growing. I'm going to be constantly adding training to this. But right now we're, we have uh, ignition training, sensor training, and product training. So we're really going after a system-based approach. Um, section one and two both will cover system type of training. And as you go through here, you'll have to complete each one in succession. You have to pass um, the test on, on 101 to go on to 102 and pass the test on 102 to go on to 103. Uh, there's going to be a pre-test and a post-test that you have to take and then there'll just be a short 10 to 15 minute video or so in the middle there where you're going to watch, you're going to learn something about whatever that title was, then you're going to take a post-test. If you pass, you move on to the next one. So we're going to keep building upon this. Um, as, as it grows, we're going to eventually add in some sort of certificate type of thing, but it's just a way an, another way to uh, get access to training that's maybe not YouTube. Um, this is something that, that you're able to, to get to and, and use and it's free of charge. And we just have a lot of really good ideas that we're going to be putting into here and including into here. So right now it's, it's kind of very young, but um, there's a total of what, 15 classes right now and that will continue to grow as time goes. So check it out. There is a link down in the description. Uh, down below in the video description here. Again, that's ngktechportal.com or you can find it through a link on the NGK Spark Plugs website. All right, so let's see how the comments are. Thank you, Keith, for linking it in the chat. I appreciate that. All right, so Let's get right into it. I do have a PowerPoint today that's just going to be kind of showing some specs um, and some, we're going to blow through it pretty fast, but it'll be up on the screen so that you guys can always go back and look at it in the future. Um, it doesn't seem to be wanting to play nice right now. Let's try this one more time. OK, 
Come on. All right, let's try this way. Okay, now we should be good. So we covered this exact slide last week, just basically calling out what exactly a wideband sensor is. It's a sensor that's going to monitor a wider range than a standard O2 sensor would. A normal action sensor is only going to read your 14.7 to 1. It's only going to understand what stoichiometric is. Our air fuel sensors, air fuel ratio, linear, UEGO, wideband, whatever it's being called, is going to read significantly richer and significantly leaner. And it's going to be able to tell the PCM exactly where this engine is at at that exact time. So it's going to be post uh, combustion fuel control. The exhaust gases flow through the exhaust pipe. The sensor picks it up, determines is there an excess of oxygen or is there a lack of oxygen. That information is sent into the PCM to dial in fueling for the engine. So instead of knowing it's either yes, it's, it's lean or no, it's rich. Now we're able to know exactly how rich or how lean it is as long as it falls within those parameters. Uh, it also allows us to stay longer in closed loop and it responds a lot faster. So this is a four wire sensor. This is what we're going to cover today on the Lexus. You can see that it looks very similar to a normal oxygen sensor. It's got uh, two pins for the heater circuit and then it's got two pins for the signal circuit. It's going to operate like a wideband though. It's going to look like a narrow band oxygen sensor, but it's going to operate like a wideband sensor. In fact, I have one right here. Looks exactly like a narrow band sensor for the most part, except it's going to output a value that's going to be directly related to the air fuel ratio. Now, these sensors get very tricky for Diag because we're not going to be able to watch them as closely like we would with the five wire that we showed last week and that we're going to show, uh, sorry, two months ago, and the uh, what we show on the BMW later. So we do have the ability on this four wire in this Toyota here to read roughly down to nine or 10 to one and then all the way up over 20 to one in the lean to rich scale. So this, this graph right here is a perfect representation for you guys. A standard good old narrow band oxygen sensor has that switching point right at 14 to seven. Anything richer or anything leaner will respond as low or high. Where our air fuel ratio sensor is able to respond accordingly. So the voltage will change depending upon where the air fuel ratio is. But this voltage here is, um, I think misleading is probably the best way to say it because we're not actually going to be able to see the voltage output, but we'll be able to see it on the scan tool. Our four wire operation, we're still using an oxygen ion pumping circuit, just like our five wire sensor is. We're pumping O2 ions across this zirconia element. We're basically measuring the presence of exhaust in the, uh, excuse me, the presence of oxygen in the exhaust gas. And then if there is a excessive amount of oxygen, we're gonna pump that O2 out. If there is a lack of oxygen, we're gonna pump oxygen in, and that's all going to be dependent upon the reference air chamber that's over here. Whatever it takes to pump that oxygen across here will be monitored by the PCM, and that's going to directly correlate to whatever our air fuel ratio is. Again, it's trying to maintain that, that stoichiometric 14.7 uh, to 1, basically just leveling those oxygen ions across that element that creates or, or requires a current flow to pump those ions across. So on a four wire sensor, we're able to see that. Now, the downside is we're working with a very, very small amount of current. We're in very, very low milliamp current to make this happen, and that happens inside of the PCM. So I've tried to put a small amp clamp on here and was unsuccessful in noticing any sort of change in the milliamps. There was too much noise coming out. I was unable to see any change when this thing was run rich or lean, but we'll show a little bit more with the scope in just a minute. Again, here's our five wire sensor. We're going to find this one over on the, uh, on the BMW. Um, I'm just going to briefly explain it because I did uh, explain it pretty in depth last time, but we basically have a normal oxygen sensor here that's uh, the nerd cell and its job is to maintain 450 millivolts or the stoichiometric point, right? 14.7 to 1. Then our pumping cell is going to pump oxygen ions in and out of the measurement chamber to maintain that 450 millivolts across this NERN cell. So we'll see on the BMW today, we're going to see that this NERN cell might change a little bit, but it's relatively steady. And then we'll see the pumping cell working as we run that thing rich or lean. 
Uh, failures went over this last time, but of course, we're looking at a slow responding sensor. Agent contamination can really um, cause our sensors to fail. Of course, circuit failures, wiring rubbing through, chafing through, somebody not putting it back where it was supposed to be and it melts on the exhaust manifold, um, a lot of those kinds of things. Heater circuit failures is actually what this sensor is right here. And then, of course, physical damage. If you drop a sensor, if you, uh, I don't know, if you hit an exhaust pipe with a hammer or something, pounding a muffler off, these are ceramic inside. It's possible to crack that ceramic, cause a sensor to fail. Now, this sensor did come out of this Lexus right here. I thought it was going to be something cool. Unfortunately, it wasn't very cool of a Diag. Um, it was really straightforward. It has an open heater circuit. So the way that we're going to check that, on most of our sensors, you're going to find the two light-colored wires to be the heater circuit. So I have two black wires on here. So I've just hooked up two pins here. We're just going to do a resistance check across there. And it should be usually a couple ohms. Uh, different sensors will have different specs depending on the heater element. But what we're looking for here is a few ohms of resistance. And as I hook the meter up and show you guys, we're OL, right? Open circuit. Now, what this looked like on a scan tool when it was being diagnosed, this actually kept bank two, driver's side on this engine, bank two in open loop. Because when a wideband sensor's heater is failed, it will not, the sensor will not function. These things need to maintain a temperature higher than the exhaust gases are able to get the sensor. So without heater operation, the sensor will not function, and it'll usually maintain open loop on that bank. And that's what this car was doing. We had one bank in open loop, one bank in closed loop, because this sensor's heater had failed. I have a known good sensor right here. We'll do the same thing. I'm gonna pin the two black wires. And I think this thing came in at like two-ish, two-ish ohms of resistance. We're coming in at 2.7. So that's gonna be a known good spec on this four wire sensor that we'll find in uh, Toyota models. But again, that might vary a little bit depending on the sensor, depending on the heater type that's in there, um, but that is pretty consistent in that two to four-ish range. Now, if you're questioning what your sensor's resistance is supposed to be, it suggests you give our, uh, give our tech line a call. Um, they'd be more than willing, more than happy to help look up that sensor number and get the actual heater resistance spec for you. Um, so just give them a call. You can find the number out on NGK Spark Plug's website. Uh, ngkspartplugs.com and then just look for the contact us, click on technical um, and you'll find that number there. Now when it comes to heater circuit failures, this car probably on the BMW, probably on just about every wideband air fuel ratio sensor style out there, when a heater circuit fails, the heater is most of the time shut off. Now we played with this a little bit in the last class, but this sensor, when the heater circuit would go open, the PCM would stop commanding ground. We would still have power flowing in. There's no real, there's no stopping that. It's, it's run through a fuse, run through a relay. We're not changing the power flowing in, but we've stopped ground side controlling it. We've left the ground circuit open to protect the PCM. In an open circuit, open heater, we really don't have an issue because the circuit's open. It's not going to flow any current. But in a situation where we would have a shorted sensor, maybe two wires melted together, or maybe the ground wire shorted to the exhaust manifold or something happened where that sensor was drawing excessive current, it could wreck the driver within the PCM. So under heater circuit faults, it's common to see the driver turned off. If you're working with a heater circuit failure, you may have to key cycle the vehicle, you may have to clear codes, you may have to reset adaptive memory, you might have to do a mixture of those things. Service information will tell you what you have to do, but you're gonna to have to do something to get that heater reactivated. On this one, Toyota says that it is a key cycle. On the next key cycle, it'll again check the circuit integrity for the heater. If it passes the test, it enables the heater circuit. If it fails the test, disables the heater circuit. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, but as, as somebody working on this car, I diagnosed the sensor, didn't check the heater circuit from the PCM because the sensor was just open. So I guess if you wanted to go further, you could check and verify that the PCM is able to ground it, maybe put a test slide in there. And like I showed in the last class, putting a test slide across the heater circuit, that'll verify it with a slight load. Um, but then it was just replace the sensor, plug it in, clear the code, fire it up, the sensor became operational, and then both banks went into closed loop. 
Um, when diagnosing a sensor, trouble codes are going to be your first and uh, most accurate way to start. Look up your trouble codes, figure out what's setting the code, figure out what has failed to set the code, look at freeze frames, parameters, those kinds of things to uh, determine that. And then we got to figure out are we working with a heater issue or a signal issue or is it a signal issue caused by a failed heater? Because again, without a heater, the sensor doesn't function. Um, so uh, again, don't expect the, the sensor to switch like a, like a standard normal O2 sensor. And then uh, trim resistors will vary from sensor to sensor. So when we come to Asians, I didn't cover all of them because this class would just go way too long. Covered the main ones, Toyota, Honda, uh, Hyundai, Kia, Subaru, and Nissan. Um, maybe in the future we'll do Mitsubishi and Mazda at some point, but covered the main ones. And again, there's not a ton of change once you understand the principles of a air-fuel ratio sensor. So Toyota started using the air-fuel ratio sensor in 1997 on the Camry and the Avalon. And across the Toyota Lexus line, you'll find that they are predominantly running a four-wire air-fuel ratio sensor. Now, it's possible that a 1997 Camry and a 2016 Sienna have very different control aspect for that four-wire sensor. It's possible the voltage values might be different, but the operation of the sensor will most likely remain the same. There might be a little bit more testing with the newer software, the newer PCM, to do uh, things like slow response or a deteriorated sensor, but the operation in the sensor is gonna be very similar to what it was way back in 97. Uh, this is a really good line that I pulled directly out of, this is a copy and paste out of service information. Thank you, Toyota, but uh, the, oops. The air-fuel ratio sensor is going to generate voltage that corresponds to actual air. I'm not going to read this whole thing, but there's this little asterisk here. The air-fuel ratio sensor is a current output element. So it's generating voltage, but it's a current output element. Therefore, the current is converted into voltage. So that's where we're getting our voltage. The PCM is doing a conversion from current to voltage inside of the ECM. Measuring the voltage at the connector, the air-fuel ratio sensor, or the ECM will show a constant voltage result. This is problematic for testing. I'm going to throw the lab scope on this sensor and we're going to see that signal 1 and signal 2, it's roughly like 3 and 3.3 volts, will remain pretty much steady, pretty much dead steady at those voltages no matter what I change with the air-fuel ratio. What's happening is happening inside of the PCM. Uh, here's just a wiring diagram. Our heater circuits fed power all the time through a fuse through a relay and then um, to the heater. Our heater is going to be pulse width modulated for uh, heater control and then our sensor will have a positive and a negative lag. Uh, heater resistance on here 1.8 to 3.4 is the actual spec. So like I said we're going to see these sensors come in at 3.3 uh, volts. The other one will be about 3 volts. If you're above 3.3 volts, the vehicle's lean. If you're below 3.3 volts, the vehicle is rich. But again, we're not going to be able to look at that with a lab scope. We're going to be able to look at it with a scan tool, but not a lab scope. Now, if our sensor is stuck at 3.8 volts for more than 10 seconds, we're going to have a stuck sensor style code where it's going to be reading rich. If it's stuck under 2.8 volts, we're going to have a, uh, excuse me, we're going to have 3.8 is lean, 2.8 is rich. Uh, over 10 amps will set a heater circuit high code. Under 0.8 amps will have a circuit low code. And again, the heater fault will disable the heater circuit inside of the PCM. Now, this can be a little bit tricky depending on what scan tool you're using. If you're looking at generic data in a, mm, a lower end scan tool, you might see a voltage that ranges from like half a volt up to a volt. These are the air-fuel ratios that you can expect. With enhanced scan tool data like we're going to use with our Varus today on this car, we're going to see that translated out in um, the actual voltage that these sensor is responding with. So just you're going to notice potentially two different voltage levels depending on what scan tool you're using. Just know how that correlates. Basically, if it's a lower end scan tool and you're getting 0.66 volts, consider that good. That is stoichiometric. Anything lower than 0.6 is going to be a rich mixture. Anything above 0.6, a lean mixture. Enhanced scan tool data, 3.3 is our cutoff. 
lower than 3.3 rich, higher than 3.3 lean. All right, so here's our wiring diagram for this, uh, this Toyota sitting right here. And I'm currently in bank two sensor one. I have gone ahead and back probed the A2A plus and A2A minus, which is just the bank two sensor one signal circuits. I've back probed them both already and we're gonna go ahead and throw the lab scope on them. Again, this is an 06 IS250. Here you can see a 15 Sienna 35 and the same style of setup. We're still running an A2A plus, A2A minus, going directly back to the PCM. Ground, what looks like ground side control for our heater element and a shared power source for uh, each sensor to power up that heater circuit. So really not any drastic changes in terms of sensor wiring or, or that kind of thing through, what, nine years of production. Now here's where some of the newer vehicles do have an advantage. They have some newer strategy that they're able to determine slow response or delayed response style testing. So they're going to look for changes in amplitude or changes in uh, time or delay. So what it's doing, it's watching the current, translating that into a voltage and determining what the change rate is from rich to lean or how long it takes for the rich to lean change to happen after it changes the fuel injector pulse. So the computer is going to force a test during each drive cycle when parameters are met, it's going to directly try to run the engine lean, try to run the engine rich, and it's going to watch the sensors for either a slow, laggy response, so it's happening later, or a lower amplitude, meaning our sensor's not as responsive or uh, accurate as it was before. So we're seeing that on newer vehicles, but again, we don't have the ability to see that with the scope. We're gonna have to use a scan tool to look at that. And um, it's, they give us parameters here at 230 milliseconds after injection control or uh, this voltage, but it's not gonna be easy to look at like it would be with a scope. Uh, so before we get into Honda, let's go ahead and throw the lab scope on here and take a look at what we've got. See if, uh, yes, and uh, Keith has a good point. Remember to snapshot these slides later for your reference. These videos will get posted, or this video does get posted directly out to YouTube after it's done, so you can go ahead and screenshot the slides uh, later for, for reference. Um, I don't think I'm missing anything major here. Um, and to Keith's point, the snipping tool on the, on the PC is great. I've talked about this in, in earlier classes, but I use this program called GreenShot. You just hit your print screen button and it opens up this ability to grab a shot and you select what you want and then you have the ability to go ahead and do whatever you want with it. I like this because then I can take it into image editor and um, I can like, I don't know, select something. And then I can save it as an image or save it in my, um, my my paste in my in my clipboard so just something something cool to work with uh, for doing screenshots and that kind of thing so back to the scope we'll get that booted up as that's booting up I'm gonna hook up and I'm gonna I'm gonna show you guys each input and then I'm gonna show you the inputs together I guess let me explain that further I'm gonna hook up channel a to either 3.3 or, or 3 volts I'm not sure which one I'm gonna end up grabbing because uh, I didn't label them. But either way, channel A is going to be ground side on chassis ground or, or battery negative or whatever I find under the hood here. The other lead is going to be going into one of these signal circuits on our wideband sensor, which I have already set some wires out here because the thing is kind of a bear to get to back by the firewall. So we're gonna go with a common ground. I'm gonna go right on top of the engine here and we'll just hook up to this lovely uh, red wire right here, which is going to one of my circuits over there. Channel two, we're going to go after the other circuit. So it'll either be three or 3.3, whichever the other one wasn't. And again, the negative lead or the black lead is going to go on common ground. We'll just share our ground source from our other one. And then we'll go on our other wire here. So we're looking at the two sensor signals relative to battery negative or, or to zero, okay? 
Now what I'm going to do with channel 3 is we're going to look at those signals relative to low reference, okay? So we're going to go our green lead on one of the pins, which I'm hoping I happen to grab the 3.3 volts on green. And then on black, on our ground, I'm not going to go to common ground. I'm going to go to the other lead or our low reference or our, our low reference for the signal, so that 3 volts. So we should see 3 to 400 millivolts or 0 0.3, 0 0.4 millivolts in between those two signals. That's going to be, um, we're, we're going to be able to look at that with the scope. And, and it's just a different way to show you what you're scoping. The values are going to be the same as long as you reference it properly in your mind. Okay? 3.3 volts is above zero, but the actual signal is riding above low reference. So our actual signal is like 300, 400 millivolts because that three, uh, that 3 volts is our low reference. So it just depends on what it is that you're referencing off of. Now, like I talked about specs before, that 3 and 3.3, those are based off of chassis ground or zero. All right. Those are hooked up. Hopefully my probes are still stuck into the sensor. And let's get the scope hooked up. Uh, we'll take a little bit longer of a time base on here. We'll go uh, two seconds per division. Sounds good. Again, we're working with about five volts. We're working with three-ish. So we'll go to a five volt scale on channel one and two. And just so we don't mess up our scaling and you get confused, we'll grab channel three. Um, at 5 volts as well. So we should expect one around 3.3, one around 3. So let's see what we've got. Now it's kind of cool. At Keon, maybe, there we go. Keon, we should see the volts just jump up. Because the sensor, like a, a normal oxygen sensor, we won't see voltage until the sensor becomes operational, right? We're not going to see that, that switching voltage until the sensor's hot and reading exhaust gas. A wideband sensor is being fed voltage by the computer at all times. So at key on, engine off, we should see some sort of voltage. So just take a look at what we've got here. I'll draw in a trace at 3.3 volts on red, uh, 2.9 volts-ish on blue, and then green should be the difference between the two, roughly 400 millivolts. So there we go. Red is going to be signal high blue signal low, green the difference in the two signals. And then let's go ahead and we'll fire this thing up. An obvious difference in noise that the scope is picking up now that we have a ignition system running. So let's take a look at our scan tool. We'll grab a data display here. Maybe. All right, so we got a data display that's calling out AF02S uh, O2 sensor data. We'll grab a custom graph. Uh, let's look at bank one sensor one, bank two sensor one. So, if you want your engine to run well, you should probably not have the brake booster hose disconnected. Um, we'll grab our trims, we'll grab that, I think that's enough info for us. Alright, so here's our voltages. So like I talked about before, our voltages right now are based upon 3.3 volts. So if it's above 3.3, think of that as our zero mark. If it's above 3.3, we're lean. If it's below 3.3, we're rich. All right? So let's try to get both of them up on the screen here. And what I'm going to do is we're going to start by forcing this thing lean. And we should see it skyrocket. But watch the scope carefully. I'm going to just reset it so we start back at the beginning. There we go. All right. So we go full lean, look at our fuel trims, they just went crazy, almost stalled out the engine, but our sensor responded full lean and our short term fuel trims also responded as full lean, just dumping fuel. 
Um, where'd my other field trim go? Okay. Well, that's all right. So we see a direct reaction, but our scope flatlined, right? And let's do that once more. Full lean. All right. So what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna let the idle stabilize back to normal. Our short term should come right back into where they belong. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna feed this thing with some propane. So I have a propane canister here hooked up to a hose which is hooked up to the vacuum port on the intake manifold where the brake booster goes. Now we should see our voltage values dip. We should see them go under 3.3 as I open this up. There we go. Nice response. Our fuel trims react almost immediately. And I'm going to shut it off. We should see it go and change almost immediately again. A small spike, but not much. Again, we'll run it rich. Almost stalled out the engine. Closed it off. So really, these fuel trims are incredibly fast. But what I want to show here is we're looking at both sensors at the same time. Now, unfortunately, we're not seeing anything on the lab scope at all. In fact, I'll pause it so we can go back to it. But on the scan tool right now, we're able to watch, and we can even pause this. And what we're looking at here is this and this. We want them to look roughly the same. This is telling us that both banks on a massive vacuum leak or a massive fuel enrichment are showing roughly the same thing. If one is showing up way later, or one is showing up maybe uh, not as low of a trace, something like that, that could show that you have a lazy sensor or a sensor that's beginning to fail. Now, it's almost impossible to know exactly what or when the sensor fails. That's what we're going to trust our, uh, our trouble codes for. They're going to be really our, our true um, judge and jury on, on, on this thing, you know, are, they're going to be the one, the trouble codes, the PCM is what's going to make the decision on if a sensor has failed or not, if it's failing the test. But we're able to kind of watch those sensors and how they react uh, against each other. Now, of course, it's only going to work on, a, on an engine that's running two air fuel ratio sensors on each bank, and it's only going to work on something that you can create on both banks. Like if I were to shut a fuel injector off on a single bank, the two sensors would respond differently. Now let's take a quick close look at our lab scope and you'll see very, very little of a difference here. The only thing that I'm seeing is maybe this line right here. So let's go ahead and let's zoom in. Okay. So we definitely went above at this point. Now on a normal O2 sensor, when we go above 450, we're running rich, right? Uh, let's start scaling back and let's see if we see that thing dip below the line at any point when we went lean. Not really any major changes. Okay, so let's call this relatively consistent. Let's go back a page. Again, here's a little bit of rich. Let's go back another page, see if we can find it where it went below the line. Oh, there's a little bit below the line. But is that enough to call the sensor functional or not? I don't know, maybe. Maybe it's functional. Um, but you could do some comparative testing again. But I think it's much easier to see on a scan tool. Now, it's possible the scan tool data could lie to us or give us bad data. That's possible but I think it's a lot easier to read on the scan tool than it is on the scope in this case. Now let's go ahead and look at our other two signals. And we see a little bit of wavering on that line, but nothing major. No major changes off of our, our dotted line there. Which is a big difference compared to looking at the domestic wideband that we were able to manipulate the engine and show that thing swing rich 
and, and lean on that sensor. It's a huge difference. And really, on a four-wire sensor, besides looking at maybe the heater circuit and the pulse width modulation of the heater, ground side control, besides looking at that, a lab scope really isn't going to help us too much. Okay? We can probably, honestly, just throw a voltmeter on both of the signal circuits, the 3 volt or 2.9 and the 3.3, and we should have a pretty good idea that the PCM is sending the voltage that it's supposed to. All right, you can back probe it, make sure that the voltage isn't lost when the car is running, something like that. You know, shake your wiring around, run min max on your meter. But in this case, I don't feel that it's more efficient to run a lab scope to look at a four wire sensor. All right, you're really splitting hairs at this point on on this line, and I, I just. Maybe if I was looking at the exact same vehicle running the exact same test or looking at bank to bank and forcing just one bank lean or rich, I might have a better idea on what it exactly is that I'm looking at, but the, the, the changes are so small that we just have to be careful that we're not looking at a noise issue, a known something with the engine being changed. I mean, there's really, really fine changes in there. The scan tool gave the information easier. Oh, Keith's out of here. All right. Sorry to see you go, Keith. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Yeah, I agree. Keith's right. To test this thing with an amp clamp, you'd have to have plenty of known good data to look at, and, and that's true. I mean, I put on the... Um, the very low amp, the what is it, the 30 amp clamp, and I wasn't able to pick anything out. Everything is just very noisy. There's a lot of noise in the scope. Uh, it's possible, maybe, to pick up amperage in line. So you could maybe take like a graphing multimeter, something like that, and go in line, run the amperage through the tool, and you might be able to see an amperage change on there. Um, and then that amperage, we don't exactly know how that correlates, where our voltage is a direct correlation according to Toyota blank voltage equals blank air fuel ratio. If we pull the actual amperage being um, ran or, or being used to make those oxygen ions move, we're not going to be able to directly correlate that off to an air fuel ratio. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba, doo -doo -doo -doo. <laughs> Your son's in Fond du Lac, Mike. You should uh, should tell him to uh, to pop in. We could have a like a little cameo uh, interruption here. All right. Now let's bump into some of the other Asian models. Of course, we only have one that we're covering with the vehicle today, but we'll bump into Honda. Honda was the first OEM to use a wideband sensor back in '86 on the Civic, and this was the um, I forget what model it is. The, the high efficiency Civic back in 86, Honda will use a mixture of a four or five wire wideband. Um, I just pulled some quick specs out of a 12 Accord 2.4. We're looking at that heater coating threshold is eight tenths of an amp to 15.2 amps. Seems kind of high, um, but our resistance spec on here is two to 2.7 for a 2.4 liter Accord. And again, that falls within our our rule of thumb, our rule of thumb on a sensor should be, you know, roughly that two to four ohm type of thing. And again, if you're looking for an exact spec, just give us a call. But the heater current thresholds to set a code less than eight tenths of a circuit, which would be a open circuit most likely, or an open heater like this guy right here, because when we open the circuit, we no longer have a path to ground, we no longer have any current flow. Or 15.2 amps on the high side, high current would be a shorted circuit, right? We're now we're, we're not allowing the PCM to um, correctly pulse with modulate that ground to get the proper temperature. It could be a sensor that's lower resistance, under two amps, maybe one amp, half an amp, something like that. Could be shorted wiring that's rubbed through, something like that, okay? Low amperage, open circuit type of thing, high resistance maybe. Um, high amperage would be a uh, shorted circuit. Um, again, Honda has the ability to look at um, sensor output. 
whether that's a deteriorated response, which we're really looking at the uh, amplitude of the signal, um, or a time differential, so depending on how long it takes to go rich or lean. So this is right from service information. I thought it was kind of, um, kind of interesting. So bank one, sensor one, output value is 34 or less in 6.8 seconds. I really thought that that 34 value was interesting because nowhere did I find in looking at the vehicle, looking and doing research, nowhere could I find a definition of what 34 was. I think what they're telling us is that is the response characteristic, that is the tabled data that Honda is using internal to the PCM that we really don't get to. Output value of 34 or less, okay? So it, the PCM again is making our, our judgment there. I think we can, I mean, we can trust our trouble codes to a point here because they are very accurate in this whole rich to lean switch over time or our amplitude over time. Um, it is able to see that very, very accurately. Uh, we could have a range performance style code. Basically, um, this is going to be a, a D cell type of thing. So under D cell uh, with the throttle plate closed, we're looking for a uh, predicted characteristic. So the sensor's looking, excuse me, the PCM is looking for a proper sensor voltage uh, that's going to be predicted. So if it sees rich side or lean side deviation, basically what that computer's looking for at that point to get a P. 2A00 or 2A003, depending on the bank, it's looking for a stuck sensor at that point. So driving on the highway, you uh, pass by or you get on an on, an on ramp, you go into D cell, throttle plate closes, fuel cut enables. The sensor is supposed to do something that's known to the PCM. There's a characteristic that it understands that at this RPM, this load, this temperature, and probably more factors, the oxygen content is supposed to be this. If it's reading rich, we have a stuck rich sensor. If it's reading lean, we have a stuck lean sensor or a skewed lean or rich sensor, depending on um, how, far it's, how far it's gone and depending on what those voltage values actually are that the computer's reading. Nissan. Nissan started using the widebands back in the year 2000 on the 1.8 liter Sentra. Again, Nissan is using a mixture of the four and five wire sensors. A lot of Nissans, you'll find 2.2 volts to be our zero mark or our stoic mark. Uh, a higher voltage is going to respond lean, a lower voltage is going to respond rich. So that's very similar to what our Lexus is doing here. Higher than 3.3 was lean, lower was rich. So on this, higher than two. Oh, that's a fire drill or a fire alarm. Hopefully that shuts off here in a second. Otherwise, we're going to have to. Uh, Possibly okay. I think we're okay. That's some excitement. So that was fun. Um, I, I think we're safe. There's nothing on fire that I can see. I have garage doors right over there, so you don't have to be concerned for my safety. If we feel the need to evacuate, we will. Don't worry. I don't need comments in there about not being safe. Um, now, where was I? Back on codes. You can see that the Nissans are also looking for deteriorated response. The reason why we're doing this, the reason why we're looking for deteriorated response is because as a sensor ages, it really becomes less accurate. And when our sensor is less accurate, our fuel control post combustion is less accurate. Our pulse width modulation of our fuel injectors is then less accurate. Overall, we increase the emissions output of our exhaust system, okay? When we increase our emissions, we are no longer compliant and we have to set a check engine light potentially, or we would fail our local emissions test, okay? So we're lo looking for uh, deterioration. We're looking for sensors that have become slow, uh, sluggish, lazy over time, and that'll happen. They're in a very tough environment, right? So they're in hot exhaust gas. On initial startup, they're being pounded with water from condensation. There's a lot of things that these sensors have to be able to put up with, and we wanna watch them over time because eventually they will need to be replaced. They're not going to last the life of the vehicle, okay? They were never designed to do that. Um, they're going to last a certain amount of time. Most of them, I don't know, from experience, this isn't a spec that I found written anywhere, but from experience, 100 to 150,000 miles seems to kind of be um, how long they last. I have a good idea, or I believe, that this sensor is original. Hard to know for sure but it does have the Toyota name on the sensor. Could be original, could be 
bought from the OE, doesn't matter. It says Toyota on it, it came out at 197,000 on here. Could be original, could be 50,000 miles old, really no way to tell. But we're watching for that deterioration and making sure that we don't have lazy sensors in our cars. Lazy sensors is lazy fuel control, higher output emissions. Uh, with Nissan, uh, I don't know how many of you run into this, but there's a self-learning issue with the 4 liter in the 06 Pathfinder Xterra. If you do not perform the relearn on this thing, you will be putting wideband sensors into that engine continuously until you force this thing to reset. It's kind of a weird one. You've got to turn the ignition on, disconnect the mass airflow, start the engine, let it idle, turn it off, reconnect the mass airflow, check codes, clear the codes, start the engine and let it idle for 10 minutes. Kind of an odd procedure. Why they did it that way, I don't know. But if you don't follow this procedure on that vehicle, you will reset a wideband oxygen sensor related code on here with a perfectly functioning working sensor in that engine. So watch for that. Uh, Subaru 1999 2.2 liter Impreza and Legacy. The majority of the sensors you're going to find on here are four wire, but there are a few five wire. Looking about that two ohm resistance mark, uh, four wire signal, you're looking about 2.0 to 2.25 for the voltage on one of the signal wires, and then our other signal wires just below that. Um, you might end up with a milliamp pit on your scan tool. If you do, zero milliamps is perfect, 14.7 to 1 stoic. If you have a negative milliamps, that means this thing is pumping oxygen ions in. We're going to read rich. If it's got a positive milliamperage, we are pumping oxygen ions out of our exhaust. So we are lean. We have too much oxygen. Okay. Uh, just a couple things. I thought this was an interesting uh, service procedure. Um, it's usually Keith, right? That's always talking about check for water. Well, <laughs> step one of... Uh, front action sensor, has water entered the connector? Completely remove any water inside. I thought this was just a little bit humorous because I've seen a lot of comments from Keith across Facebook and stuff about looking for the water. So that's kind of for you, Keith. It's unfortunate that you've already left, I think, for the day. Uh, then we're just checking basic uh, resistance checks of harnesses, which, I don't know, not my favorite type of test. Um, and then basically replacing the sensor. Uh, if it's poor contact, high resistance, fix that issue, otherwise replace the sensor, which doesn't seem like a lot of testing, but like we just showed with the four wire sensor, we gotta look at data um, because really our lab scope's not giving us what we need. Uh, Hyundai Kia, year 2000, Hyundai ran a wideband in the two liter Elantra. Uh, majority of them are going to be a five wire sensor on here. That heater resistance between two and three ohms, roughly 2.4, 2.9. Uh, pretty straightforward wiring diagram. You'll find this across most of the vehicles. But what I did find was a cool test that I was actually unable to perform with the Varus. I tried on a 12 Elantra to run this exact test. So what it's doing is the forced monitor test is going to force this thing lean and rich and look at the response time in conjunction with the rear O2, which is kind of cool. So it's doing kind of like an oxygen style um, looking for capacity type of thing, plus it's watching for that change from that front O2, which is just kind of cool. Unfortunately, I tried to run it with the Varus on a 12 Elantra and I was unsuccessful. This might be an OE only. That's what these screenshots are from, is from an OE test. Um, if you've had success with that, let me know. But it's basically just doing a rich lean run like we did with the Lexus, pull a vacuum hose, let extra air enter in, add fuel. We're running it rich and lean. We're just looking for a response. Uh, but what's kind of cool is Kia gives you, or Hyundai gives you a nice data log from that. So we can see the sensor voltage values, um, and then we're able to see the transition time, sensor resistance, peak-to-peak um, -peak voltage. So it's, it's pretty cool that you're able to see all of this information. And then you can save this as a known good and do some comparative testing when you're dealing with these sensors. Uh, just note the sensor resistance would be the resistance while the sensor is operational. Um, you're not going to ohm out that resistor, excuse me, that heater circuit and see 79 ohms of resistance. It just doesn't work that way. Um, plausibility check on Hyundai Kia. It's going to look under partial or full load conditions. It's going to watch for that signal. Um, if it's above 3.1 volts, it is going to set a fault code for that. 
If it's um, 3.1 volts or below, it's going to set a fault code for that. Uh, it'll also run a fuel cut decel type of check as well. Okay, so that's a quick rundown on <laughs> everything is water. It's a quick rundown on um, Asian vehicles. Um, uh, P help Phelps Auto or P helps Auto. Um, you get a good point here with snap throttle. Snap throttle is kind of a cool test when looking at air fuel ratio. I'm going to probably be able to do it on the BMW. We're going to snap the throttle. When the throttle comes back down or, or closes, we're going to go into fuel cut and we should see a nice change in our, in our output. Um, all right, let's just jump into Euro then. So BMW started using wide bands on the 745 back in 02. Uh, majority, if not all of the sensors they're using are going to be a five wire sensor. Uh, just know which system it is that you're working with, which DME, which software, which manufacturer of the system was because they will operate different. They'll give you different codes depending on if they're the Bosch or the Siemens system. Short to battery voltage for a sensor will indicate a rich condition where on the Siemens system it indicates a lean condition. Okay, Just know which system it is that you're working on so that you aren't chasing your tail uh, when it comes to specs and testing. Um, the heater circuit low and high codes parameters are 10 milliamps on the low end and 11 amps on the high end. So open and shorted um, 10, 10 milliamps to 11 amps. Here's a diagram that we're looking at. Again, we're working with a three liter um, straight six motor. So BMW is kind of cool that they separate that straight six into two banks. We're going to be probing into the uh, sensor that's reading the rear bank on here. And we'll go over there in just a second. BMW is also watching the switching rate and the amplitude. It's going to force artificial lambda modulation. Sounds super fancy, but all they're doing is forcing the vehicle rich or lean and watching the time it takes to switch and the um, amplitude or the values that it's able to obtain. That's all it's doing is it's forcing a test to run. Okay. Uh, kind of cool little um, Screenshot here for you guys that just has a lot of the codes related along with threshold values. So this is what we're really looking at is how long did it take to set and at what values did it set. Okay. And I think we'll just run through Volkswagen, Audi, and Mercedes really quick just because we can and then we'll jump, jump over to the Beamer. Uh, 99 on the 1.8 and 2.8 Beetle, Golf, and Jetta, mainly, again, using a five-wire sensor. Heater resistance, 2.5 to 10 ohms, seems, oops, seems a little odd to me. On oh, that 10 ohms seems a little high, uh, but that was a spec that I was able to find. I haven't found an actual sensor that reads at that yet, though. Um, not a lot of information on Volkswagen Audi. They're really doing what everybody else is doing, using a five-wire sensor, doing the same type of tests. Um, I think if we had a uh, more European enhanced scan tool, we might have a better shot at looking at more data with these vehicles. You'll see with the BMW using the Varus, I really have very limited information. Um, actually, we're going to be using the Autel on there, but the data was roughly the same. Very limited information. So um, you might get more when you're looking at this with a factory tool or something that's more European based. Uh, but we're going to look at these sensors today as a non-euro shop. Uh, Mercedes-Benz 03 is when they started using them on the 1.8 liter uh, and the C230. Again, five wire sensors. It is capable of interpreting 0.7 lambda to 4.0 lambda. Um, that lambda PID, one lambda is stoichiometric. Under one, so 0.7, would be considered rich. Anything under 1.0 is rich. Anything over 1.0 is lean. So just keep that in mind. If you have a lambda pit and not an air fuel ratio pit on your scan tool, under one, rich, over one, lean. Okay? Um, all right, that is it for that. I think we're gonna bump over now onto our uh, BMW and try to get everything moved without disconnecting everything. Do, do, do. Okay, 
Now we're just going to grab the lab scope and we're going to look at a couple different things. What's really nice with this BMW here is the sensor connections are right up on top of the valve cover. So everybody's always, I don't know, complaining about working on BMWs but or European in general. But honestly, this was kind of nice um, to be able to access the connector right there instead of having to shove my hand between the cylinder head and the firewall on this, on this little Lexus over here. That was a, a lot more of a pain to get that one hooked up. All right, so what we're going to look at on here is going to be a good way for you to be able to test or, or watch this sensor operate. Um, maybe if you don't have a scan tool, it's probably unlikely that you have a lab scope and not a scan tool, but if you forgot your scan tool at home or you want to verify that the data that you're actually getting is accurate or you just really like using your scope and you want to get it out of the box because you haven't used it for a few days, you know, whatever. Uh, but we'll be able to show some direct manipulation of the air fuel ratio and show you how it responds with the vehicle. So I got three channels active. I think what we're going to start with is by we're going to start with taking a look at the heater just to show you guys how the pulse width modulation operates as the sensor begins heating up and then how it changes as the sensor warms up, gets up to operating temp and we slow that pulse width down on there. So let's go ahead. We'll shut off our other channels for the moment. We'll just run channel A. Run, actually, we'll run channel B as well. We'll grab power and ground. So we're going to run them at 0 to 20. And we're at 2 seconds per division. So I'm going to run channel A. Grab an alligator clip here. We're going to run our black lead, ground lead, on a chassis ground or battery ground. So we're going to reference off of 0 on here. And then I forgot my probes. And then we're going to run our other lead here. We'll run channel A into one of the heater circuits, which is pins three and four on this one, which is the middle of the connector. So back probe into that one. That should give us something, voltage or ground. And then channel two, we'll reference off of that, that zero point, that battery negative, and we'll go into the other, whoop, the other side of the heater. And we'll see what we've got. Okay, get this thing fired up and take a look. Hello. All right, so channel A is our ground side control pulse with modulated and channel B, our red channel, is our voltage PID. So you can already see our pulse width is changing as this sensor is heating up. So here, our signal was wider, keeping our heater on longer, and now it's narrowing. So um, I'm going to let it run for just a second. It's kind of normalized now by the looks of it. And what you're able to do with this is you're able to watch both sensors if you wanted and compare the heater time between the two. So maybe you have an intermittent issue or you think a sensor might be going bad, something like that. You're able to compare the, the time that it takes to heat up. Because here in the beginning, we have a long pulse width modulation and then we bring it over. We'll start to change that. All right, and as we continue to come over, you'll see more time where that blue trace is up here at 12 volts. That means we're not grounding the circuit at that point. We're not flowing amperage. Oh, I got to throw the hose on it. The alarm's going off. At least it's not as bad as the fire alarm was. All right, so we'll continue over and you can watch as our, our time spent up here is increasing. The more time we have spent at that battery voltage mark, 
the less current we're applying to the sensor is basically what that is. We're not grounding the sensor inside the PCM. We're not allowing that path for current to flow through the sensor. So we are basically creating an open circuit there, right? So when we're up at battery voltage, the voltage is running through, current's running through the sensor, and then it's piling up at the open circuit mark. And that's inside of the PCM. So we go open circuit, we spend more time up at that, up at that battery voltage line, meaning our, our heater is, is drawing less current on that sensor. All right, so that's heater current. Now we're gonna take and let's grab pins two and pin six are gonna be our, our NERT cell. And I'm gonna actually go directly across the two. So I'm gonna take channel A and our ground, set those down, and I'm gonna go directly across. So one is gonna be on pin two, the other one on pin six. And this is gonna give us what that NERT cell is reading. It should be roughly that 450 millivolt mark. Pin two, pin six. There we go, we'll drop off of the 20 volt mark. We'll come down to a volt and I do have the polarity switched around. Let me, uh, I'll just reverse the polarity on here and we'll see that come up above zero. All I'm doing is switching the blue and, and black, the positive and negative. And there we go. We'll actually put this right at the 450 mark. All right, so now our line is at 450 millivolts. So this is the cell that's being maintained by the pumping cell. The pumping cell's job is to pump those ions in or out to keep this at 450 millivolts. So we'll see a little bit of change, a little bit of wiggle in this line, but we're not gonna see what we're gonna see on the pumping circuit. That's what we're gonna look at next. So on channel two, what I'm gonna grab is another back probe. Grab the whole box. Um, that'll work. I'll have another table. So on channel two, we're gonna grab one of the pumping pins. We're gonna grab probably, we'll start off with pin one. Pin one is gonna be our pumping circuit that is not going through the trim resistor. Pin five is gonna be our trim resistor pumping circuit. So we're gonna show them both just to show you the difference. Uh, somewhere in my alligator clip, we're gonna reference this to battery negative, to chassis ground. So we should see a voltage on here, pin one. Make sure my probe is in there good enough. All right, so we should already see some change in this line as the vehicle manipulates itself uh, at idle. And then we'll grab one more and we'll go in pin five. Again, we're referencing off of zero and pin five. I think we gotta turn that channel on. We'll drop our voltage down here a bit. Too far. So you can see Red and green are laying directly on top of each other and they're gonna maintain themselves pretty close on that line. Now, let's get the scan tool operational and let's look at some data on there. So I'm going into oxygen sensor control. We have additive and multiplicative field trims. Additive is going to be our, basically at idle offload. Multiplicative is gonna be our loaded trims. Uh, oxygen sensor control, that is meaning that our sensors are active. Um, signal upstream is really what we care about. So we'll grab that, we'll grab that, and let's just grab some trims. And we'll see what we got. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna graph these. So it looks like 1.5-ish 
is our mark on here for stoic. We'll run them both like that, and now we're gonna start doing some manipulation. All right, so I've gone ahead and under the hood here, um, let me grab my flashlight. <clears throat> but if we get a close up, you'll see the purge solenoid right there. Right there's the purge. I've gone ahead and I've got the hose ready to disconnect. So we're gonna force this thing lean and then we're gonna force it rich with that propane. So I, let's try to get both the scan tool and the lab scope up on the screen so you guys can see how exactly it is that the system is going to react when we, uh, when we manipulate it. So we'll start by going lean. And I'm going to go ahead and zoom in my uh, channels here. Oops. Okay, so that's lean, and you can see our scan tool has gone full, full lean. It's increased voltage just like our Toyota did. And now I'm gonna kinda plug it up a little bit. That should return it back to normal-ish. You saw the dip on the lab scope, right? Now I'm gonna force it rich. Open up some propane here. And there we go, we're starting to bring it into the rich side. I'm gonna shut it off, and our scan tool should respond, and our lab scope responds. It goes lean because it's gotta change. The, uh, the fuel trims are gonna be a little slow to respond on here. They don't seem to respond as fast as what the Lexus did. Again, we'll open up some propane. She dips rich, just like we wanna see. Shut it off, and we lost our ground. Put that back on. Ignore that glitch. Wow, I'm gonna go to a different ground spot, I guess. There we go. All right, now I'm gonna pull this out and we'll go lean. Barely running. And we'll put it back to normal. So what we would really end up wanting to do here is grabbing bank one and bank two, because that would give us a good comparison between the two. So instead of looking at both pumping circuits, I'm gonna grab pin one on both connectors and take a look at what we've got from both sensors. And they should be, if I can keep my ground on, should have grabbed a different, different clip try that again. So bank one and bank two on this straight six engine should respond pretty similarly. I would expect maybe a little bit of a change. I'm going to move our nerd cell down here just so it's out of the way. You can see a little bit of discrepancy between the two banks. Let's go ahead and pull that vacuum hose again. There we go. Both banks go lean. Plug it back in. Both banks go rich and then they, they stabilize or, or find themselves at a happy spot. Now, if we pause this and go back one page, you'll see a slight dip in our nerd cell right here, where we went and changed. That little bit of a dip is this sensor doing its job. It's this sensor working. So again, a slight change, but nothing, nothing major, not, not like looking at, uh, you know, not like looking at this change here. You know, this is an obvious, obvious change that both bank one and bank two are doing. I am a huge fan of comparative testing. So if we're doing something on here where we're dealing with a sensor issue, a sensor failure, sensor fault, whatever, if we're looking for a slow sensor, a laggy sensor, something like that, compare the banks. If you have the ability, compare the banks. It gives you so much vital testing information. And what are the chances of both sensors failing at the same time? If both sensors are doing the exact same thing, 
find something that's changing the air-fuel ratio for the entire engine. Maybe a vacuum leak or maybe an issue with that. If you have a single bank issue, a single sensor issue, it's more likely to have a sensor failure or a single bank issue, maybe an ejector issue, a coil issue, a vacuum leak issue on a single bank. Okay? Use comparative testing to your advantage. In a properly running engine, bank one and bank two should run very, very, very similarly. And as we saw when we manipulated this engine, they both dip rich, they both go lean at roughly the same scale. So use that to your advantage when you're diagnosing this thing. It's way better than having to pull in a known good with a three liter straight six in there and running the test again, having to hook all that up again. Use what you have available. And a lot of times we can compare sensor to sensor and get a lot of information. All right, I think let's bump back over to the other table. Do, do, do. Questions on that. So again, if we go back to here on the diagram, we were looking at first the heater circuit, so we were probed on pin four and three, looking at our heater circuit, ground side pulse with modulated control here, power fed in all the times through a 30 amp fuse. Then uh, I think it was two and six, I think we were probed into, right? Two and six were our um, NERT cell. I have to write myself notes because remembering this live can be tricky, but two and six are inert cell, one and five are pumping circuit, okay? So one's through the trim resistor, the other one is not, but those are what you're gonna use, one and five for pumping, two and six for trim, or inert cell, excuse me, inert cell, not trim cell, inert cell, and three and four for the heater. <laughs> Thanks for a $2 donation for putting up with you guys in chat. I love the chat. So I will put up with you guys always because it's just fun. Unless somebody's being mean. Let's see here. Is somebody being mean back here? Um, I'll have to read back through it later. All right, any questions on this? It's all in good humor, of course. And that's, that's what I have come to expect from you guys. A little bit of, of uh, razzing of me is, is always fun. Thank you. Uh, I think that's Brian, right, for the uh, donation. I appreciate it. Uh, the, the alarm, we have a carbon monoxide monitor in here. Uh, basically, when the alarm is beeping, there is a high level of carbon monoxide. So... Um, the exhaust fan will probably eventually kick in and um, basically making sure that I don't pass out on camera. Should be good. <laughs> um, any other questions? Again, this was just a good, I think, overview on looking at the, the Toyota or the, the Asian, really, um, aspect. A lot of Asians will run four-wire sensors, and then the Europeans, a lot of them will run a five-wire sensor. And really guys, all we're looking for on a five wire sensor, get access to that pumping cell and take a look if you can see some voltage out of there. Most of the time you will. Now, depending on what you reference to, again, with that ground lead on your scope, depending on what you reference to will change your voltage values. But as with just about every bit of testing that we do as people diagnosing cars, we need to be looking up our information, right? Use your service information. If you have access to factory information, or the different repair resources like we use, go ahead and look for specs in there. Look up code set criteria. Look at what it's taking to set that code so you can get some values out of there so you can apply that to your testing because there's really no sense in performing a test unless we know what we're testing for. Each vehicle, each manufacturer, each model, each engine could have different testing parameters. It's impossible for me to cover everything in regards to Euro and Asian, but this was intended to be an overview to look at the different sensors and to really have you not, not scared of working on the Euro cars. A lot of people turn Euro cars away. As long as you have a little bit of time to do some research and understanding of the system, they really don't operate different than anything else. And sometimes the stuff's harder to work on, I'll agree with that, but on this wideband sensor, it doesn't get easier than slapping both of the connectors right up on top of the valve cover for our testing. I mean, way easier than a lot of the cars that we work on. So, 
any other mm, O2 sensor affecting uh, a cat code, so a PO420 cat code. Um, I Keith loves put me on the spot, but I believe when we're doing a 420 test, we're going to compare. We'll do some comparison between front and rear. We're going to do some intentionally running rich, some intentionally running lean to look at oxygen storage capacity. Um, yeah, so a 420 code. I mean, we pretty much already know 420 code is going to end up probably end up needing a cat unless you can prove out that the O2 sensor is sluggish or, or not responding to the proper amplitude. Um, but the PCM is going to look for certain values on that sensor. Um, okay, I think that's probably about it, guys. I hope you enjoyed this class. <laughs> no, I didn't just say that. Okay, let me rephrase. We're not putting in a catalytic converter for a PO420 code. We're doing our proper testing. Um, because that's always, 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 always best. Because, you know, really a lot of times a 420 code can set for the dumbest reason, like a small pinhole leak or a bad flex pipe, something where there's excessive oxygen getting in there, you know, something like that could cause it. Um, so, again, can you guys head out to here and check out our tech portal? Um, that's how I'm going to be able to get your email addresses right now to send you guys updates. So create an account, put your email in, you'll get added to the list so that you'll be able to get a email update. Usually I send them a week or two before the class. Uh, they're usually always coming in on Thursdays. Um, but that way I can advise you to when the next class is, uh, which is looking to be September 5th, unless something changes. But again, that's where that email comes in. So if you sign up for this, I'll put you on the mailing list and you'll get an emailed reminder about the next class. So I think that covers it. Look at your service information for wideband sensors, air fuel ratio sensors, so you have a good understanding of what it is that you're looking at. Read your code set criteria. It's really, really going to help when you're diagnosing these cars. Scan tools and lab scopes go a long way on here. There's no way our voltmeter would have been fast enough to track those changes in that air fuel ratio. Okay, it's going to give us skewed data. Graphing multimeter might be able to do it. Lab scope is going to be ideal. All right. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming, watching from all over the world today. Everybody was announcing where they're from. I really appreciate that. You know, making it fit into your schedules. It's, I know it's hard to fit in a, a live class in the middle of the day, and I'm almost leaving before the t-shirt giveaway. Whew, that would have been bad. Congrats to the five people who won it last month. Today, here is the question. Two technicians are discussing proper operation of a wideband air fuel ratio sensor. Tech A says that the sensor signal reading under one lambda during decel is normal. Is that normal for the sensor to read under one lambda during decel? Tech B says that a lower air fuel ratio signal amplitude can be caused by both sensor deterioration or potential rich and lean conditions. What's going to affect the amplitude signal on our air fuel ratio sensor? Give me an answer, tech A, tech B, both or neither, and then give me a reason why. Explain it. Let's see what you guys think. Giveaway is only good for today, 8, 8, 19, August 8th and 19, and email it out to mcbecker at ngksparkplugs.com. First five people to get the correct answer that haven't previously won a shirt will win a awesome diagnose before you triagnose t-shirt. Okay, again, congrats to the winners from last month and, and all of our previous winners. And uh, we'll throw the question up once more with my email address, send that out today. And uh, again, first five people to get the correct answer on here will be a winner. All right, so I think we're gonna close it out. If you haven't already, please give us that thumbs up if you enjoyed this today. Put your comments below, questions below. I'd be happy to get back to, uh, to any of your questions that I might have missed or given uh, a more in-depth explanation on something, whatever you're looking for, go ahead and put those comments below. Share the video if you'd like uh, with your friends and stuff like that. And uh, 
yeah, I guess we'll see you in September. Um, not sure what we're going to be covering then, but I'm sure it's going to be something fun. So we will see you in September. Thank you for coming, and uh, we'll see you guys next time. Happy wrenching, everyone. Thank you.